Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. Our case this week is about the Santoni family. A case once believed was lost to time, but pretty recently was solved. So, as always, I ask you to join me as we remember Connie Villa, Francisco Santoni, and their son, Dante Santoni Villa. Concepcion Villa, who went by Connie, was born on December 8, 1965 in El Paso, Texas. Connie was one of 13 children raised in a devout Catholic family. She was described as a very loving, kind, and generous person. She found work as a travel agent for a travel boutique where she was a top contender for the company. The exact time frame is unknown, but eventually, Connie struck up a romantic relationship with a man named Francisco Santoni. Francisco, who was born on July 2, 1935, was an international auto parts broker. Prior to Connie, Francisco was married to a woman named Maria Santoni. Together, Maria and Francisco had three children, two daughters and a son. The two separated after some time. Despite being legally married, Francisco and Connie pursued their relationship. He purchased a two-story home in an upper middle-class neighborhood called Garden Gate. The home sat behind Montwood High School in a cul-de-sac. The general consensus of Garden Gate was a safe and quiet place, especially for a growing family. On July 20th, 1991, they welcomed their only child, Dante Santoni Villa. Connie and Francisco seemed to be doing well for themselves. They led a generally private life. They didn't have too many friends and only associated with a few neighbors, specifically ones with children around Dante's age. According to one of Francisco's friends, he wasn't very flashy, but definitely had expensive taste. They claimed he only owned nice clothing and doubted he had a suit worth less than $500. He also owned several watches that he swapped out every day and sometimes wore jewelry. Francisco's entire office had come to know and like him. Due to the nature of his job, he often traveled outside of the country but when he returned, he always gave out little gifts to the staff. Some nights he took them out for drinks to chat. They described him as one of the nicest people you could ever meet. As far as anyone knew, the couple had no major problems and really just lived for their son. According to family, the couple's home was almost paid off and Francisco planned to have a new home built for them. He had a lot of plans for the future. They seemed very happy and were family-oriented. Both Francisco and Connie dedicated themselves to Dante. On the morning of August 11, 1994, Connie's sister grew concerned when she received word that Connie did not show up for work. It was very unlike her sister to not at least call if she wasn't going to be in that day. So she drove to Connie's home to check up on her around 10.45 a.m. She tried knocking on the door, but no one answered. She noticed Connie's car, a Dodge Colt, wasn't there. Since she often helped her sister with housekeeping, she had a spare key, so she opted to let herself inside the home. Immediately, she knew something wasn't right. The house seemed to be slightly ransacked and was just vacantly quiet. As she approached her sister's room, she felt uneasy. Nothing prepared her for the carnage behind the door. Both Connie and Francisco were on the floor, saturated in blood. Connie wore her nightgown while Francisco appeared to be fully dressed. Her mind immediately raced to her nephew, Dante. So she rushed down the hall to the boy's bedroom, only to be struck with grief. On the bed was three-year-old Dante, face down and also deceased. Her sister phoned the police, begging them to get to the home as soon as possible. The home, once filled with love and laughter, quickly became swarmed with police activity. Investigators determined Connie was targeted first, in the master bedroom. They believe she was attacked in her sleep not long after midnight. The killer then went to Dante's room and attacked him second. According to a neighbor, Francisco arrived home after midnight and was more than likely surprised by the intruder in the hallway. He was stabbed multiple times before being moved into the master bedroom next to Connie. The coroner determined the victims were stabbed 10 or more times each. Initially, the motive was believed to be robbery, but upon family inspection, nothing of value was taken, so it was ruled out. 
Inside of the home, there were no signs of forced entry, and despite signage for a security system in the window, no system existed. Per neighbors and family, Francisco often left the garage door open until he went to bed, since he went out several times a night to smoke cigarettes. Once he was ready to turn in, he would lock up the house for the night all at once. Evidence, which included fingerprints, were collected at the time, but since it didn't develop a workable lead, it was shelved for future use. With the scene secured, they turned their sights to the missing vehicle. A police bulletin was put out for the 1994 Dodge Colt. They believed if the car was found, it would be a huge step in their investigation, which at this point had hit a standstill. The big hurdle in the case was motive. Police couldn't understand why someone would want to hurt this family. Those closest to the victims were ruled out first. After speaking to neighbors and Connie's family, they learned of Maria, Francisco's wife. Although the two were married, many stated they didn't think there were ill feelings between the two and were fine with the arrangement since Connie and Francisco were living together for years before their deaths. Maria and her children were slated to inherit Francisco's life insurance policy, so they were interviewed but quickly dismissed. Maria and her children were all accounted for, being out of town at the time of the murders. The same went for Connie's family. Everyone had alibis that checked out. The neighbors were interviewed as well, who were unaware anything happened to the family until the following morning when police arrived. They claimed they got along with the couple since their sons played together. They were quiet and they didn't seem to have enemies. The block captain was also interviewed who stated their neighborhood was very security conscious. They established a neighborhood watch group and pitched in money to buy a streetlight for a section of the road that was too dark. They recently started another fundraiser to place another light behind the victim's house because of the big open field that connected to their backyard. With no leads generating from the home front, police set their sights on their work lives. One person in question was Francisco's good friend and business partner, Abel Gonzalez. Abel was one of the last people to see Francisco that day and claimed police were already trying to interrogate him, and he was worried about being looked at as a prime suspect in the case. In response, Abel hired an attorney, who then hired a private investigator to help clear his name. Coworkers explained that Abel and Francisco were great friends and had been for a long time, with Abel referring to him as his brother. Much like other leads in this case, the Abel one dried up. There was nothing found to connect him to Francisco's murder, and despite what Abel thought, Detectives claimed he was never a main target in the investigation. They were just looking at everyone involved. The private nature of Connie and Francisco's lives made the investigation a tough one. When the family was discovered, a full-blown task force was in effect for weeks. All law enforcement in the area were involved in the case to some capacity, including the FBI. The case was taken to the FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia for review with the agency's behavioral science experts to help establish a potential profile for the person behind the crime. Days after the bodies were discovered, police received a tip on the Dodge Colt. The owner of a car garage called to report a car that was left in park for days, seemingly abandoned. The car was identified as Connie's and was nearly 22 miles from the home. The cult was parked in the Union Plaza area of downtown at the intersection of Durango Street and Paisano Drive, a location a few thousand feet from the border of El Paso and Juarez, Mexico. Inside of the car, they discovered clothing later identified as Francisco's from the home. They were able to lift some fingerprints as well, but beyond this, nothing. What they thought would be the smoking gun in their case turned out to be another dead end. During the initial press run of the crime, details around the case were kept sealed from the public, but as time continued on, investigators turned to the public for help. They released little bits of information, such as the order of death, and pleaded with the public to come forward with any information, no matter how minor. They wanted anyone who knew the victims to come and talk to them. The lead investigator claimed with most cases in the area, they usually develop good leads, but with this case, they were totally in the dark, as they had no motive that stood out or even suspects. And as the months turned to years, police were no closer to solving the murders. The case grew cold but remained an open investigation for nearly three decades. But as hope diminished, a lead would finally surface. 
Due to the advancement in DNA testing and forensics, El Paso police received a break in the Santoni murders in 2015. DNA evidence recovered from Connie's fingernails was tested where a man named Arturo Ortega Garcia was linked to the murders. A warrant was issued for his arrest, but unfortunately, Garcia was nowhere to be found. For years, he went undetected by law enforcement until he was arrested in Mexico City in 2020 on an unrelated charge. Garcia was extradited from Mexico City after serving a two-year sentence. When he arrived in Texas, he was arrested by the U.S. Marshal Lone Star Fugitive Task Force in 2022. During his arraignment, he entered a plea of not guilty to the charge of capital murder. Currently, he is being held on a $5 million bond at the El Paso County Jail while awaiting his court date. At this time, there is no information as to why Garcia murdered the family or how he even knew them. His trial is scheduled for April 8th of 2024. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna keep an eye on this case and either make an update video or a post to inform you all of the outcome since we still have a good bit of time before his trial actually comes here and more information comes to light about what or why this happened. I don't typically cover ongoing things because of this reason, but, but I figured I would give this one a shot since there's not a lot of information about this case out there. But as always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more from me. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you so much for your support and kindness always. You're the best and I hope you know that. But for now, stay safe out there and I will see you in the next one. Bye friends. Bye friends.